Thank you for joining with us. We continue our series through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at Matthew chapter 25, and we're looking at verses 14 to 30. Just by way of introduction, author and pastor Randy Elkhorn describes a trip that he made to Egypt uh, several years ago. He writes this. He says, the streets of Cairo were hot and dusty. We drove past Arabic signs to a gate that opened to a plot of overgrown grass. It was a graveyard, a graveyard for American missionaries. I found what I was looking for, a sun-scorched tombstone that read William Borden, 1887 to 1913. Borden was a Yale graduate and heir to great wealth. He rejected a life of ease in order to bring the gospel to Muslims there in Egypt. Refusing even to buy himself a car, Borden gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to missions. But after only four months of zealous ministry in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis and died at the age of 25. 25. Alcorn writes, I dusted off the epitaph of Borden's grave. And after describing his love and sacrifice for the kingdom of God and for the Muslim people, the inscription ended with a phrase I've never forgotten. It said this, Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. We then went straight from Borden's grave to the Egyptian National Museum. The King Tut exhibit was mind-boggling. Tutankhamun, the boy king, was only 17 when he died. He was buried with solid gold chariots and thousands of golden artifacts. His coffin, his gold coffin, was found within gold tombs, within gold tombs, and within other gold tombs. The burial site was filled with tons of gold. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife, one where they could take earthly treasures with them. But all the treasures intended for King Tut's enjoyment in eternity stayed right where they were until Howard Carter discovered the burial chamber in 1922. They hadn't been touched in more than 3,000 years. Alcorn writes this, he says, I was struck by the contrast, the contrast between these two graves. Borden's was obscure, dusty and hidden in the back alley of a street littered with garbage. Tutankhamun's tomb glittered with unimaginable wealth. Yet, where are these two young men now? One, who lived in opulence and called himself king, is in misery in a Christless eternity. The other, who lived a modest life on earth in service to the one true king, is enjoying his everlasting reward in the very presence of his Lord. You know, it is certainly true that usefulness in this life of the kingdom of God is far more important than any feeble attempt in trying to protect our earthly treasures. In fact, our usefulness as servants of our king includes how we use the treasures that he has so graciously given to us. And that's really the key point of our parable here this morning in Matthew chapter 25. Here in this gospel, we are fast approaching the end of of Christ's earthly ministry. The plot to kill Jesus, his betrayal, the horror of his crucifixion is just over the horizon. And knowing that time is running out, Jesus gives his disciples here in chapter 24 and 25 his last warnings and final instructions about what the end of the world will be like. And what he wants his disciples to know, and that includes you and I, is what his second coming will be like, what heaven will be like, and what will that final judgment be like. In fact, his overall theme is be prepared, get ready, get geared up. The key verse in this whole section is found in Matthew chapter 24, 4, verse 42, where Jesus declares, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. <laughs> the King is coming back. You know, if there's one overarching message in the final words of Jesus, it's the warning that the end will come as a complete surprise, and a lot sooner than we could possibly imagine. And Jesus illustrates the point to his disciples here by painting a word picture. And that word picture is called a parable. In fact, the final three parables of Jesus have to do with God's final judgment. This morning, I, I want to examine the final parable of Jesus, and it's the parable of the talents. It's a fascinating 
uh, parable. When we talk about the key to understanding what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, uh, of heaven looks like, this parable really prepares us for understanding what's going to happen when the king returns. And what we discover in the parable of the talents is the fact that the basis of God's judgment really boils down to our faith and our faithfulness. Now, people today, uh, they don't want to talk a whole lot about God's judgment. Uh, the judgment of God is really not a topic that you want to bring up in polite conversation. Uh, maybe around the coffee maker at work or at formal, formal uh, dinner parties. Uh, but the reality is, as Hebrews 9, uh, 27 promises, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Now, remember that the Bible talks about two kinds of judgment. Uh, the one judgment is called the great white throne judgment, and it's a judgment of condemnation. This is the final judgment for unbelievers who will someday stand before the ultimate judge to receive their final sentencing to a Christless eternity. But the other judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ. And this is the judgment not for condemnation, but for commendation. In other words, this is where commendation or rewards are passed out. This judgment is for God's children only. And if you're a true child of God this morning, you will not face the great white throne judgment. You don't need to worry about that. Why? Because you have put your faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who paid the full penalty of your sin on that cross on your behalf. But as a child of God, as a, as a kingdom citizen, you will face the judgment seat of Christ, which is really a, more of, a, of an award ceremony. In speaking to believers in Corinth, Paul writes this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Notice that word all in this verse. That means you and I and every single believer who has ever lived down throughout history will stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. But again, this is not a judgment as to whether or not you will make it to heaven. I mean, that issue has already been settled once and for all. This judgment is about rewards or the loss of rewards. And so I want you to picture uh, this moment when you stand before the very throne of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And all of your works, all the things that you did in this life will be tested in his presence. What we have built into our lives that does not last will be lost. And that which we have built into our lives that does last, we will be rewarded for. Every one of us will be rewarded for our faith in how we used our time, our talents, and our treasures. And so to illustrate all of this, Jesus uh, tells the following parable beginning here in verse 14. Please follow with me. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, enter into the joy of your master. The one also who had received two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came and said, Master, I, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. 
then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him, and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. And cast out that worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to quickly highlight this morning five key points from this story uh, about the master and his three slaves because it really does help us to understand what's expected of us as kingdom citizens. How are you living your life as a follower of Jesus Christ? What are the measures of success that you and I will be held accountable for? Well, the very first point is still a reminder, another reminder to us, that God owns everything. He really does. Everything we have, God owns. We're just his money managers. <laughs> Verse 14 tells us that before the master left on his journey, he entrusted his possessions to his three servants. Now, we see here that the master's possessions consisted of a, a total of eight talents. And we know that one talent, just one, weighed between 60 and 80 pounds of silver, which means that the master entrusted his three servants here with a huge chunk of change. But it wasn't the, the servant's money. It was the master's money. They were simply entrusted to use it for the master's benefit, not their own benefit. The point is clear. Each and every one of us, as the Lord's servants, have been entrusted by him with riches and abundant resources and treasures in this life. And so I'm reminded of the fact that God owns it all. I'm just his money manager. Psalm 24, 1 reminds us, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who live in it. Haggai 2, 8 states emphatically, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Back in uh, Deuteronomy 8.18, it tells uh, the people of God, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who has given you power to make wealth. 1 Corinthians 6.19 even points out that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And so again, you and I are reminded to adopt a steward mentality when it comes to our money, when it comes to our resources. Your home, your car, your investments, your, retire your retirement, everything. God owns it all. You're just his money manager. You're his wealth manager. We are God's stewards when it comes to all that he has so graciously entrusted us with. You know, I'm convinced that God entrusts us with money basically as a test. Like a toy given to a child, it is training for the handling of things of far more value. Why? Because how you handle your money, the money that God has entrusted you with, really determines everything else about you. A few years ago, I read a fascinating book on the life of Napoleon by Andrew Roberts. And one biographer writes this. In 1815, Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, and the hero of that battle was the Duke of Wellington. The Duke's most recent biographer claims to have an advantage over all the other previous biographers. His advantage was that he had found an old account ledger that showed how the Duke had spent his money. That, says the biographer, was a far better clue to what the Duke thought and was really important than the reading of any of his letters or his speeches. Can you imagine? If someone wrote your biography on the basis of your checkbook and your income tax return, what would it say about you, about your loyalties, your focus, about whom you serve? God owns it all. You're just his money manager. Can you honestly say that you're living your life in light of that reality? Second point of our parable, I want you to notice here is how each servant is entrusted with riches in keeping with his ability. Verse 15, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. You know, what's really interesting about that, the master obviously knew his servants, and he knew them well. He knew, the, he knew their strengths, he knew their limitations, he knew their capacities, 
And it was the master alone, basically, who determined who got what. The servant was not a part of the decision-making process. The obvious point here is the fact that the Lord knows you well. And he entrusts each and every one of us uh, as his servants with certain treasures, with certain resources in this life, depending upon our ability to handle them. You know, I've often wondered what it would be like to win the lotto. <laughs> now, the odds of winning are so astronomically high, especially if you don't play. <laughs> they, they say that the chances of you dying on the way to buy a lotto ticket is far greater than you actually winning it. <laughs> but if I were to be really honest, as much as I think being a millionaire would have great advantages, I'm not so sure I could handle it. Why? Because I know me. <laughs> In fact, I'm terrified that if I were to become filthy rich, I would undoubtedly become more proud, more self-sufficient, more self-centered than I already am. That kind of wealth could very well bring out the worst in me. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but I'd still like to give it a shot anyway. Hey, listen, don't fool yourself. <laughs> most of those with a ton of money, most, are not necessarily handling it well. Some of the most arrogant and most miserable people I know are failing the test of being wealthy. But again, the Lord entrusts each and every one of us as his servants with certain treasures, with certain resources in this life, depending upon our ability. For example, if you're not consistently giving back to the Lord what little time, talent, and treasures that you have today, don't fool yourself into thinking that you would give more if you had more. Why? Because it really boils down to a heart issue. That's why Jesus states in Luke uh, chapter 16, verse 10, He who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? In other words, listen, if you and I can't be trusted with our filthy money wisely, for God's use, why would he ever entrust you with what's far more valuable, and that is spiritual maturity and ministry to others? In verse 21, the master says, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And so he alone, God alone, decides who gets what, knowing how you and I can best be used to further his kingdom and to best fit into the body, that is, the church. Ephesians 4.15 states the purpose. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You know, that tells me that there's not, there's not one single person in the church body that is dispensable. We desperately need one another, including each other's time and talents and treasures. We do. Again, each servant is entrusted with riches and resources in keeping with his ability. And with greater ability comes greater accountability. Which brings us to the third point in our parable. Every servant is held accountable for the treasures entrusted to him. Look at verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. In other words, listen, there is a payday someday. You know, the first time that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he came as a suffering servant, born in a manger, lived as a servant, died on a cross. However, the next time he comes back at his second return, uh, he comes as a conquering king. Matthew 16, 27 tells us, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. That word recompense in the Greek, uh, apodidomai, means to give back, to return, to restore. It has the idea of rendering a payment or a reward. So what is that saying? Simply that there's going to be someday a payday. Now, everyone I know looks forward to payday. <laughs> That's where we get compensated for our work. That's when we receive our reward, so to speak, for all of our labors. That's when the bills get paid. 
But it's never enough, is it? Jesus talks here about the ultimate, the ultimate payday. And he tells us that every person will receive a payment upon, uh, based upon what they deserve from what they did or did not do in this life. In other words, we are held accountable. And so you and I are held accountable in eternity, really, for what we've been so graciously given here in this life. Which brings us to the fourth point of our parable. Our rewards are based upon our faithful investments. Now, we're not talking about uh, your stock portfolio, okay? Verse 16 tells us, Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, what I want you to notice here, is how the first two faithful servants here were rewarded for their faithfulness, basically in two ways. First, they were given additional responsibilities. That was great. And secondly, they shared in the master's joy. Verse 23, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, there really is joy in serving the Lord. There is. If you don't find joy in giving, if you don't find joy in serving, something is desperately wrong. One of the shortest but most powerful chapters in all the Bible is Psalm 100. I love this psalm. Uh, the psalmist says, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Listen, again, there is joy in giving. There is joy in serving the Lord. And Jesus is telling us here that the Christian who is faithful in his or her sphere of service and ability, even if it's small, will be rewarded accordingly. I've shared before how there will uh, maybe be some little old grandmother who diligently prayed for her unsaved grandchildren every day who may get a reward as big as Billy Graham. Now why? Because one of the principles of divine rewards and punishment is that of proportional responsibility. In other words, as Jesus points out here in verse tw uh, Luke uh, 12, verse 48, from, and from everyone who has been given much, much shall be required. It follows then that those who have been given little, well, less will be required. And so if that dear old grandmother used what few opportunities God gave her in this life to maximize her abilities, then proportionately her reward someday in heaven could even be greater than someone who had bigger opportunities and abilities in this life but didn't use them as they could have. Levels of reward will vary according to opportunity and ability that God has given you. Andrew Murray once said, the world asks, what does a man own? Christ asks, how did he use it? In other words, we are all born with various abilities. We're all born with various uh, resources. And the Lord then gives us opportunities to faithfully use and exercise those abilities and resources. And so the important thing is to be faithful. When you and I get to heaven someday, the words that we're going to hear from the Lord is not, well done, thou good and successful servant. No. <laughs> it will be, well done, uh, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. First Corinthians 4.2 tells us, It is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Are you faithful? That's God's measurement. <laughs> are you faithful? When we are faithful with what God gives you and I, uh, we are promised blessing, we're promised rewards, both in this life and also in the life to come. The fifth and final point of our parable this morning is the fact that judgment will also be based upon a lack of faith and faithfulness. When you look at the third servant, I want you to notice here in our parable, I want you to notice that he, he didn't lose his master's money. 
He didn't spend his master's money. No. Verse 18 tells us that he went out and dug in the ground and he buried it. Why would he do that? Why would he bury the master's money? Well, one very simple reason. He did not know the master. He didn't really know him. In fact, he excused himself here in verse 24. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you gathered or scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. And see, you have what is yours. Now let me ask you a question. Is that true? Was the master a hard and difficult man? Not at all. I don't believe that this servant really had any true understanding. He had no real true faith in his master. He had a, a gross perception and a misconception of what his master was really like when he stated, I knew you to be a hard man. In other words, you're a shrewd taskmaster. You're a tough businessman. You're a harsh CEO. You have no problem with telling people they're fired. And because of that, verse 25, he states, I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. That kind of reasoning indicated he didn't really have any understanding or real faith in his master. Now in verse 26, Christ repeats the servant's unjust accusation, but he does not say that it is true. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave, you knew, and I would say supposedly, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. In other words, listen, if what you believe is true about me, you should have then worked even harder to please me. This man squandered, this man wasted what had been so graciously given to him, and he proved to be a worthless servant. You know, this servant does not represent the true Christian. He doesn't. Why? Because again, he obviously did not know the Lord. When we truly know the Lord, when we truly love the Lord, we will put all of our faith and our trust in him. The tragedy of this servant and his lack of faith and knowledge is that he lost the resources, he lost the opportunity he had been given, and he was cast into judgment, eternally separated from God. And so this man was not a true believer to begin with. Now, what picture comes to your mind as to what the master is like? Uh, how, would you, how would you describe the God that you serve? Why is that important? Because what you truly believe about God, deep down inside, in the very inner recesses of your being, really determines how you will faithfully serve him. Larry Crabb, in his book, Shattered Dreams, rightly points out that it really all boils down to two questions that we need to ask ourselves. Who is God? And who are we? You see, God is understood as either a holy God of passionate wrath, as the Bible reveals himself to be, or, as some mistakenly view him, as a stern father of strict standards. He's just waiting for you to blow it before the hammer comes down. Or still others uh, just see him as simply a helpful guide to useful principles. You see, the concept we have of God affects the way that we view ourselves as either sinners deserving the judgment of eternal hell and in desperate need of a savior, or we're just scoldable scoundrels in need of a little discipline, or just misunderstood children in need of a hug. <laughs> What's your concept of God? Your view of him will directly affect your view of yourself and how you will serve him. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boasts of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. By way of application, uh, the real point of our parable is that we know that God can be trusted. But can you? <laughs> Are you reliable? 
Are you reliable now, today, with what God has so graciously entrusted you with? What are you and I doing with our time, our talents, and our treasures? You know, there are so many believers today, I, I think, who don't seem uh, very bothered by the lack of effectiveness and blessing in this Christian life. They seem content in just burying in the ground what they have in order to protect the treasures that God has given them. And they seldom use them. You know, 10% of any given church across the country, 10% in any given church give nothing, not a dime. 40% in any given church give very little. 40%, just a few bucks. Maybe they serve once in a while. Maybe they come to church occasionally. 25% in any given church give some, uh, but it's minimal. It's inconsistent. They serve sporadically and they come to church maybe half the time. Another 25% in any given church give consistently, sacrificially. They serve faithfully in an area of ministry that they're passionate about. And they're in the church most of the time. Are you reliable now, today, with what God has so graciously given to you? What are you doing with your time, with your talents, and with your treasure? If our parable is telling us anything, it's reminding us here that time is running out. The master is coming back. So let's make our, our prayer the one found in Psalm 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. In other words, Lord, help me to squeeze out every drop I can from every opportunity, from every resource that you've given with what little time I have left in this life. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 5.15, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. He adds over in Colossians 4.5, Conduct yourselves with wisdom, making the most of of the opportunity. You know, every year, most businesses, most companies undergo a performance review process to help each other to be more effective and as effective as possible. And it can often be a, a kind of a sobering experience. Performance reviews are not always fun. But there's coming a performance review someday that will make all of our reviews on this side of life look pretty casual. The gravity of the fact that at the end of our term of service here on earth, we will all undergo a job performance evaluation. We will. Romans 14.10 tells us, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. So then, each one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, I'm not so sure what I'm going to hear someday, but I wrote down these words that I would love God to say to me someday. I'm not so sure I'll hear them, but I hope to. Brad, you were faithful with what treasures I entrusted you with. You loved and served your family well. You loved and served my church well. You poured yourself out like a drink offering, and you abided in my love. You sought to know me and to be transformed by my spirit to live in intimacy with me, and to grow to be an authentic Christ-like child of mine. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, who doesn't want to hear something like that? I've discovered that serving the Lord in the use of our gifts really boils down to the three A's. First, our attitude. It ought to be motivated out of love for God. A want to, not a have to. Secondly, our ability, which God has already provided. And finally, our availability. Now that's a tough part. <laughs> are you available? And that's often what it really boils down to. And I'm absolutely convinced that, that the health and well-being of any church body, any church family, is determined by the level of involvement of God's people, using their gifts, using their resources in the ongoing building up of the body of Christ and outreach to the world around us in desperate need of a Savior. Are you available? The Bible tells us, get ready, for the next big act in the drama is his return, the next thing on his prophetic calendar. In Revelation 22:12, 12, Jesus states, Behold, I am coming quickly. 
and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. And with all that's happening in the world today, he might even come back in 2021. Who knows? Meanwhile, may we be found faithful servants. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the privilege of serving you. Lord, we are your servants. We always want to be reminded that, Lord, we serve you and that everything you've given to us belongs to you. We're just your money managers. So help us, Father, to be found faithful in what few resources or great resources and abilities that you've given to us. Father, help us to take the time, talents, and treasures that you have blessed us with and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the time is short. And so, Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. We pray that we would continue to keep our focus uh, on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And may the words of our mouth and meditations of our heart always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.